Welcome back. This last week, I had someone ask me about the jokes I do at the beginning. I think because they weren't very entertained by them. And I was thinking about that. I'm like, you know what? It's kind of nice. If anybody is listening to this and doesn't know me, I'm five foot six. And so I've spent my whole life making short jokes. And it's kind of nice to stretch my comedic legs a little bit and make long jokes. That sounded better in my head. Moving on. <clears throat> this week, we're going to talk about why do I stay? Last week, we talked about we want to start pursuing something better. We want to actually aim and replace the bad habits and bad behaviors with something wholesome and holy. But if anybody's been down this path for very long at all, they know that falling off the wagon is something we do over and over and over again. And that gets very frustrating and depressing very quickly. And so this week, again, I want to really start focusing more on what are we replacing it with? What do we want to move towards? Uh, and so this is going to kind of feel a little bit like a downer week, but I, I think we, this is the, the next place to stop. So, oh, yes, I forgot I put this light in. Um, this week is going to be me reading out of the book, like pretty much the whole time. <laughs> so if you don't like listening to me just reading this might be an episode to skip because I'm going to tell you, we're just going to jump into like, I'm pretty sure it's chapter nine. I'll check really quick here. Chapter eight of Unwanted. So, which speaking of Unwanted, uh, this is really the first time we're jumping into this book. I really like this book. I really like all these books. Uh, this title, I think, is a good play on words. It both is talking about the phrase unwanted sexual behavior as well as the, the root cause of men feeling unwanted, right? So there's a, a play on words there of both the behavior that's unwanted and the, the sensation of being or feeling unwanted. And of course, he leads to the conclusion in the book of like, no, you are wanted. You are wanted very much by your creator. And before we jump into it properly, I kind of want to talk about the elements of our sexual stories. And to do that, I'm going to talk about real elements here for just a moment because I'm a nerd. So up on the screen, we have three different compounds. On the top there, some of you might recognize glucose. That is sugar. That's the most basic sugar there is. Um, it's not white sugar like you bake with. If you took white sugar and broke it in half, one of those halves would be glucose. Um, when we talk about plants making their own sugar, right? Photosynthesis, they're making glucose. Whenever we think of food as being fuel, as opposed to like foods, obviously lots of other things like you eat protein and that's like the building blocks, the raw materials your body actually builds with. You get um, vitamins and minerals and all that stuff. But when we think of food as being fuel, that's glucose, all right, sugar. The second one there is acetic acid. Acetic acid is the main ingredient in vinegar. That's not true, it's not the main ingredient. The main ingredient in vinegar is water, right? Vinegar is like 99.9999% water. But what makes vinegar vinegar and not water is that little tiny bit of acetic acid. It's what makes vinegar acidic. And on the very bottom there is ethanol, all right, and alcohol that we also put in gasoline, all right? So three very different compounds. We have a sugar, we have an acid, and we have an alcohol. But you might notice, if you're very clever, that all three of these are made out of the same three elements. They're all carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's it. Same three elements, just in different quantities and arranged into different shapes. Well, in the same way, our stories, specifically our sexual star stories and our sinful sexual stories, have a lot of the same elements. And we're going to talk about the elements today. Now, those elements are going to be arranged in a unique way to you. They're going to have different, qu you're going to have different quantities than somebody else. But the elements themselves are fairly universal. And they are deprivation, dissociation, unconscious arousal, futility, lust, and anger. 
and that seems like a lot, but we're going to break them down, each one, one at a time, and I'm going to start reading. All right, so jumping into Unwanted, Chapter 8, starting with Deprivation. Although unwanted sexual behavior appears to be a towering tree of self-indulgence, self -indulgence, its strength comes from the massive roots of deprivation beneath the surface. Deprivation and addiction share similar architecture, serving one another when the other is absent, much like a seesaw. Those who deprive themselves of meaningful relationships and self-care are more likely to require other people or things to offer what they are lacking even if they are destructive forms of the real need. The compulsive choices provoke their counterparts. The more the individual acts out, the more likely they are to deprive themselves of meaningful relationships and self-care because they do not feel as if they deserve them. In my research, when women and men perceived that they had unmet needs, meaning they did not believe that their needs were important or they felt they needed to be secretive to get their needs met, they are incredibly susceptible to unwanted sexual behavior. Uh, men who bought sex were nearly four times more likely to report unmet needs. Men were two and a half times more likely to pursue or fantasize about an affair when they reported their unmet needs. Uh, women were nearly five times more likely to pursue or fantasize about an anonymous affair when reported unmet needs. All right. Ignoring your needs is not virtuous. It is dangerously irresponsible. Your spouse, parents, and friends are not responsible for meeting your needs. You are. Lawrence was two years out of medical school when he sought treatment. He described his residency as such. The worst hell since middle school, only now with other people's lives on the line. I was working 90 hours a week responsible for saving lives, and at the same time ridiculed by the other doctors for any mistake I made. I was completely exhausted by work and the demands on my life. When I had finally had a day off, I would crash. I didn't eat or sleep well. I was losing touch with people, and the only thing that carried me was what life would be like when I finished. Money and power are in the back of every resident's mind. Pornography had been a part of Lawrence's life off and on during medical school, but when he completed his residency, his unwanted sexual behavior amplified. He started using dating apps for hook, hooking up and ended up buying sex several times. Uh, to quote Lawrence again, Looking back now, I see that it was entitlement from a decade of deprivation and training. I had just finished the most rigorous feat I could imagine and now had money and power. I had decent friends in undergrad, but by the time I finished med school, I didn't have one close relationship. I remember thinking that even if I had wanted to get married, I didn't have a single friend who could be a groomsman. This made it easy to continue doing what I was doing. The catch-22 of deprivation is that it promotes entitlement while requiring that one sink even deeper into deprivation. One of the primary reasons men and women stay in a place of unwanted sexual behavior for decades is that they have not addressed the areas of self-deprivation in their lives. My research shows that only 27% of pornography users had a solid pattern of self-care, including exercise, eating well, and time with friends. The majority of those who struggled with unwanted sexual behavior chose passivity over against asking for what they need or being honest about what they are experiencing. They roam through life feeling overworked and underappreciated, which sets up entitlement for experiences they believe they deserve. Deprivation occurs in both overt and subtle ways. It may appear superficially noble, such as always deferring to others to decide where to go to dinner because of the fear of making the wrong choice, or taking on extra projects at work because of preferring exhaustion and stress over rest and meaningful relationships. For others, it is a neglect of basic physical care. When I ask my clients about sleep or the last time they visited a doctor or dentist, their an answers are often alarming. They commonly report feeling as though they are behind on something, such as work projects or cleaning out their cars. One client told me that his company owed him more than $125,000 and in the same session told me that a yoga membership and eating more healthy foods would be too expensive. 
The painful discovery many people make is that they never notice how deep the roots of deprivation were until they found themselves trapped in unwanted sexual behavior. Uh, suspending the impulse to condemn this behavior will allow curiosity about the ways addiction purports to nourish legitimate needs. That's a heavy sentence, so I'm going to read that again. Suspending the impulse to condemn this behavior. So we're going to take a break and, and not condemn this behavior. We're just going to look at it for a minute. Will allow curiosity about the ways addiction purports to nourish legitimate needs. All right, addiction claims to nourish legitimate needs. It is difficult to see how far we have wandered in search of these legitimate needs, but it is our lament that gives us the courage to return home. In the parable of the prodigal son, the younger brother discovers his deprivation through feeling the hunger in his belly and the shame in his soul. Paradoxically, it is the awareness of this deprivation and squandering behavior that fills him with the longing to return to the comfort of his father's home. Dissociation. Unwanted sexual behavior is an escape, but also return to a familiar position. What exactly are we trying to escape from? Research findings offer some perspectives. 60% of people look at their lives and all they see is failure. Not, not lives. Um, of people struggling with pornography. 57% are unmotivated in life. 56% do not believe their needs are as important as others. 55% are feeling overwhelmed. 47% feel guilty most of the time. If your life is full of failures, lack of motivation, guilt, feelings of being overwhelmed, and anxiety, you are clearly going to want to flee reality. This flight from reality is known as dissociation. Dissociation depressurizes the difficult work required for us to become mature and competent adults. Dissociation is a psychological term used to describe disconnecting from full engagement with your body and the relationships around you. Dissociation is likely something you have been doing since childhood. Think about the hours of TV, video games, and internet you consumed growing up. For many individuals, the distractions of technology were more consistent than a deep, loving engagement with meaningful relationships. We experience these dissociative moments every day and in almost any context. I remember lying on the floor next to my children when they were infants. One moment I was staring into their eyes, mirroring their smiles, and echoing their coos. Seconds later, I was looking at the cell phone I had placed behind their heads, checking my email, scrolling through my Instagram account and seeing how many likes a recent Facebook post had brought in. Dissociation seduces us out of the present moment and into a meaningless world of distraction. Dissociation becomes more complex when it is woven into sexual arousal. When I work with couples attempting to rebuild their marriages after the negative effects of an affair, pornography addiction, or buying sex, we eventually begin to talk about the particulars of their sex lives from the initial moments of arousal to the restful moments post-orgasm. What happens between couples in those moments reveals and predicts the quality of their sexual lives. For most couples, although their bodies are woven together, the dramas unfolding in their minds could not be further apart. Many men express anger at their wives for their apparent fickleness with desire, but beneath the surface is intimidation. A man intuitively recognizes that a woman's desire is far deeper and more complex than his own. Although she may have ebbs and flows of sexual desire, the holistic longing she has for intimacy will often far surpass his own. Confronted with this reality, a husband can see it as an invitation for personal and relational growth, or he will default to an angry disappointment that his wife's arousal does not function in the same masculine manner. For men to change, they must exchange blame for the opportunity to grow. Most often, men resort to hiding and blaming to avoid the necessity for change. Men who have demanding or overly intimate mothers are likely to perceive their spouses in a similar fashion. Cognitively, you may know that your wife is not your mother, but emotionally you have a harder time telling the difference. Men who have experienced abandonment or disengagement may constantly project these dynamics onto their wives. The issue here, though, is not that the man is wounded by a parent figure. It is that he insists on creating a relationship 
in which he can use blame to aid him in avoiding the need for maturity. Most men have an intuitive sense that more attunement and delight with their partners would improve their sex lives dramatically. Instead, they fall into the trap of feeling powerless or angry. Many wives, through many headaches, know it will cost too much to ask their husbands to offer something different, to engage, to honor, to stay connected. A woman knows that what is likely to follow is either her husband's cowardly departure or a toxic blaming because she resists giving herself over to his linear pleasure. When a couple will not engage with delight, affection, and individual passion, both will be tempted to escape into private arousal narratives. Therefore, a husband and wife may be physically joined with his or her spouse, but emotionally and spiritually fused with someone else in a fantasy. Men and women may play out a fantasy with an ex-lover or a person from the office. And if one partner is involved with pornography, he or she may recall the most recent content. Most people are not proud of these fantasies, but at some level they feel justified because the, their spouses are not the lovers they desire. Dissociation in marriage seduces you to leave the difficult relational realities of the present and escape to a fantasy arousal where you are in control, appreciated, and entitled. Forms of dissociation, such as adulterous fantasy, to some degree, are present in er every marriage. This is not something to be condemned by or ashamed of. Dissociation is an opportunity for what Jesus refers to as metanoia which my theologian friends say is unfortunately translated as repentance. The better definition would be a turning or revolution, meta, in the mind or consciousness, nous. Um, the climax of Paul's theology in Romans 12, verse 2, is, to call, is a call to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Again, the word nous. Marriage will expose our minds. Marriage will expose that our minds are far more broken than we could have ever conceived. But more importantly, it gives us opportunities to renew our minds. Marital faithfulness is not predicated on the absence of failure, but on the persistent commitment to the renewing of minds. The choice to repent creates the possibility for personal integrity and relational growth to occur. The more we recognize our need for Jesus, the more we will grow. That brings us to unconscious sexual arousal. Now, sexual arousal and the pleasure we derive from it was God's intention. As we've learned, sexual arousal can be distorted only through being a parasite of how God designed our erotic lives to function. Sexual arousal is a roadmap to our unprocessed lives and one of the primary dimensions God will use to aid our redemption. The more we understand what our sexual fantasies symbolize, the more we can allow them to show us the road to redemption. Every part of my day is full of sexual arousal, Joseph said with exasperation. I get on the bus and wait to see if the most attractive woman will notice me. I walk into work and I can't keep from noticing what the women in my office want me to notice. And when I get online, pop-up ads and clickbait with beautiful women come up. All day long. Joseph would then freeze-frame the images and scenes until later in the day or week, when he would masturbate or have sex with his wife. Joseph found himself fantasizing about being sexual with his colleagues late in the evening after his co-workers left work or leaving on a lunch break to go to a hotel a few blocks from his office. The only way he could stop his arousal was to imagine his wife discovering him in the hotel. Joseph's fantasies were largely about creating a repetitive and familiar world of arousal. Arousal may, at first glance, seem as self-explanatory as a de desire to be with an attractive partner. And yes, sometimes it may be just that. But it is rarely that stagnant. It moves forward, constructing a story complete with a plot, themes, characters, and dialogue. Even though Joseph knew his fantasies, the meaning remained unconscious. So, how does Joseph filter through the barrage of images and storylines to decide which ones to act upon or fantasize about? This will primarily involve the process of narrative as we take pictures and scenes and, like a film director, allow them to tell a story. 
The storylines and themes of our arousal reveal the imprints of our emotional and sexual histories. This could be repeating situations we have known in the past, as we will come to see in Joseph's case. Or it could be a counter storyline, such as a woman who begins opening herself up to an affair because she finds her husband emotionally vacant. Rather than allow this fantasy to invite her to greater integrity in fighting for her marriage, she finds excitement and revenge in seeking out an affair. To understand why your sexual brokenness is part of your story, you need to identify the blueprints of your sexual and relational stories. When I ask my clients about the particulars of their arousal, they are either embarrassed or offended. But the main response is something along the lines of, that is strange to talk about. I never really thought about it, much less been asked. Why is that important? I respond by saying that all of us have an arousal map or cocktail, which is a constellation of thoughts, images, fantasies, objects, and situations that sexually arouse us. For some, this could be the anonymity of a business trip, a wallet full of cash symbolizing to them power and possibility, an empty house where their behavior will not be interfered with, or a guy's trip to Vegas where excess of money and alcohol gives way to sexual risks. Let's go back to Joseph. Joseph had an arousal map that was shaped by the season of his father's affair when Joseph was 10 years old. His father was a banker. The summer before Joseph began sixth grade, his mother came into the living room where he was playing his Nintendo 64 and disclosed that his dad was likely cheating on her. She told him to accompany her for an investigation. For about two weeks, they would leave the house around 11.30 a.m. and sit in the parking lot across from the bank, waiting for his dad to take a lunch break. When he finally left the bank, they would follow him across town as he dined at various restaurants. Joseph would sit in the idling car as his mom would di discreetly walk by cafes and enter restaurants to confirm that his dad was eating alone. Joseph says, These times were entirely arousing to me. The search, the anticipation of what we might discover, and the endless curiosity about the type of woman my dad would find attractive. My mom and I were voyeurs, in a way, and I began sexualizing particular women on these stakeouts. I would look at their shoes, their pants, their dresses, and begin to take guesses as to which ones would be more likely to have an affair. It's so crazy to me that I'm still doing this. The second week of their mother-son investigation, they followed Joseph's dad to a local hotel. My body was pumping with adrenaline. I wanted to catch him. I wanted to know who he was sleeping with, and I also dreaded the outcome because I knew he would leave our family and I'd be stuck with my mom for the rest of my life. His father checked into the hotel room and walk, or into the hotel and walked to his room on the second floor. Minutes later, a woman his mother knew from a work party joined his dad in the hotel. My mom went berserk. She screamed inside the car, opened up the car door, and sprinted to the second floor. She stood outside the hotel room, cursing, screaming, and pounding on the door. As counseling progressed, we explored how deeply Joseph's sexuality was formed the summer of his father's affair. In his adult life, he repeated these investigations to find candidates for an affair. For Joseph, the prospect of an affair is wildly more arousing than pornography because it is closely aligned with the particular ways his sexuality was formed and harmed. Although your story may not involve stakeouts with your mother, your task is to understand how your unique fantasies may be revealing portions of your story. Many people continue to act out in similar ways over a lifetime because they have never taken time to think about the symbols and stories inherent within their arousal and fantasies. These sexual reenactments must be named if you have any hope to find freedom. Your arousal map is not a life sentence. It is an opportunity to discover your life and exchange a broken and unconscious map for a redeemed one. And that takes us to... Futility. One of the most powerful, though not entirely surprising, findings in my studies was the association between pornography and a lack of purpose. The greater a man's futility, the more likely he was to increase his pornography use. 
In fact, men were seven times more likely to escalate their pornography use if they lacked purpose in their lives. These men felt as if the work they did were meaningless, struggled to find a sense of purpose, looked back over their lives and saw many failures, and often felt unmotivated. It is crucial to understand the implication of this finding. You cannot change your relationship to pornography if you do not have an effective plan for engaging the lack of purpose in your life. Pornography is not an isolated struggle. It is a symptom of a much larger issue of futility. Men who do not have strategies to transform their futility inevitably begin to lean on something to assuage the powerlessness they feel. One of the fascinating trends with Google Analytics is we can now track porn data to specific cultural events. One example of this would be the 2017 NBA Finals between the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Golden State Warriors. According to a popular porn site, when the San Francisco Bay Area knew that the Warriors were about to win the championship in Game 5, porn traffic in the city was 21% below average. Once the game was over, porn traffic in the Bay Area returned to normal. But residents of Cleveland? The city's porn use increased 34% from 6% below normal during the game to a staggering 28 extra percent after the game was over. The role of futility in our work, our relationships, and even our favorite pastimes cannot be underestimated in shaping our attraction to pornography. Gen pff, excuse me. Genesis 3 provides a very good starting point for understanding the nature of futility as it relates to a man's life. In the passage, Adam and Eve have just eaten from the tree they were commanded not to eat from. God is not terribly pleased and begins outlining the curse for Adam. He says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. According to this passage, the curse for a man is that his life will be marked largely by what we would refer to as futility. Everything a man attempts to do in life will eventually be marked with difficulty, pain, and meaninglessness. You can almost hear the taunt of this curse. Go ahead, build whatever you want, but it's all going to be surpassed. It's all going to burn. Men find pornography appealing precisely because it allows the thorns and thistles of, fu of futility to disappear, at least for a moment. Futility is experienced when we work hard to get a promotion at work, but are passed up. It's when student loan debt compounds faster than we can pay it off. It's when all the efforts we take to change our lives leave us only more discouraged. A lack of purpose will eventually lead to behavior where very little risk or imagination is required. This is one of the reasons people are drawn magnetically to watching others, whether it's through porn, sports, or television. Nothing is required except consumption. In watching the drama of characters unfold on a screen, there is no personal crucible for change. In watching others play sports, there is no physical commitment required to experience victory. In watching pornography, there is no relational maturity required to reach orgasm. Watching provides men a world without futility, that is, until they attempt to get out. The draw toward pornography does not indicate that you need to get your boxing gloves out for a heavyweight fight against lust. Instead, it may be revealing the latent pursuit of purpose in your life. We often live afraid of being caught in our pornography use, but in reality, pornography has already caught us in futility. Rather than fighting lust or shame, let your sexual brokenness motivate you to find greater meaning in life. If you want to fight, don't fight to eliminate desire, fight to discover meaning. Max, an assistant manager at a local warehouse club store, started therapy after he was tested for a sex sexually transmitted infection. The results were negative, but his doctor encouraged him to pursue help if he sensed his behavior was getting out of control. The doctor recognized that men who buy sex tend to become reckless with their lives. Max cared less and less about the things that once mattered the most to him, his body, relationships, and career. 
essentially anything that had the potential of bringing goodness and meaning to life. In our second session, Max talked openly about the trajectory of his sexual behavior that escalated into his decision to buy sex for the first time. Although not all men who watch porn will go on to buy sex, Max found his pornography use to be a significant factor in his ultimate decision to buy sex. He disclosed that scenes of women on their knees serving men were the most appealing to him. In reflection about this, he noted, over the years, I have had an increased pull toward scenes that were aggressive, even violent at times. Normal sex between a man and a woman just didn't do it for me anymore. A screen didn't do it for me anymore. I needed a person. More than 50% of men who buy sex have a current sexual partner. These statistics seem to imply that there is something other than loneliness or an absence of sex that is contributing to these men's entitled demand of sexual exploitation. Much like viewing pornography, soliciting sex allows a man to enter a world that exists in the fray of futility. Above, above the fray of futility. I asked, Mass, <clears throat> I asked Max if he had any sense of what was currently fueling his behavior. He disclosed that another warehouse was opening in the area and he had been the supposed front runner for a managerial position. In the end, another manager received the offer. An opportunity he thought would change the trajectory of his career instead became another iteration of disappointment. As far as he could forecast, his life held little purpose. At the end of that agonizing week, he searched online for a young prostitute. He made the necessary arrangements and arrived in a, ho in a hotel parking lot on the north side of town an hour later. As he waited in his hotel room, he knew exactly what he was about to purchase, the right to order a woman, really a teenager, to kneel before him and serve him precisely the way he wished. Futility fueled his entitlement and anger. Max and many men are bound to compulsive behavior because they do not metabolize their futility without turning towards a sexualized anger. The madness of unwanted sexual behavior is that the very thing we develop to assuage the lack of power ends up becoming a powerful master over us. Futility is never content with ruining one aspect of someone's life. It wants to reproduce, infiltrating every aspect. This is pornography's seduction to men. Bring me your weary and defeated heart, and I will give you a world where it will all go away. In the end, pornography confiscates not only your purpose, but also your heart. And that finally brings us to lust and anger. To be sure, lust is one of the most important contributing factors to sexual brokenness. But in our focus on lust, we easily lose sight of the other interrelated factor that drives our unwanted sexual behavior more than all the rest. Anger. As explored in Chapter 3, despite the potential damage lust and anger cause, they are not holistically something to condemn. Lust points to a great desire for a good thing, like beauty or belonging. Anger aims at our longing for justice and restoration. Sin enters when lust is hijacked by our covetousness, or demand, and when anger is hijacked by entitlement, contempt, or dogmatic control. Sexual brokenness can never be redeemed through futile attempts to stop lusts that ignorantly disregard the insidious role anger plays in fueling it. By aiming at their partnership, however, beauty, belonging, and restoration can indeed become the foundation of our sexual lives. In Matthew 5, Jesus addresses the nature of sin. He says that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully commits adultery in his heart. Often overlooked, however, are Jesus' remarks on anger that appear first in Matthew 5.22. Jesus says that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. James 4 bring these together. Lust and anger are related. Jesus' words are a tough pill to swallow. In our sin, we are not only adulterers, but murderers too. Lust and anger are even present in my children's lives, although the presentation is often very endearing. When my son was almost two years old, my wife and I reveled in how much he loved such a wide range of foods. It didn't matter, matter if it was chocolate, goldfish crackers, kimchi, seaweed, or kale. He wanted it all. One day I came home with takeout from a Thai restaurant. 
He saw the iconic white takeout box, and his body started dancing with excitement. I placed the food on the table, and he looked up and pointed his fingers to his tongue, saying, Huh? 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 I opened the takeout box, and I offered him one piece of chicken. He exploded with anger. He fell to the ground and pounded his little fist into the hardwood floor. No! Tall bite! Big bite! As you can see, desire, if not satisfied, will often give birth to anger. Lust and anger are the primary tributaries that flow into the river of unwanted sexual behavior. I have never met someone who struggles deeply with lust who is not also battling with unaddressed anger. You can lust for pornography, but in the background, you might be angry at your spouse for not being sexual enough. You can be angry that a friend didn't invite you to a party, and almost immediately you find yourself lusting for a hookup to override the experience of betrayal. Lust is important to address, but it is like a car battery. It starts the engine, but we need anger to fuel our drive through unwanted sexual behavior. Unequivocally, I believe male anger to be at the heart of much of the sexual brokenness and violation in our world. We will explore this concept in more detail in the following chapters. Rarely do I meet men who are consciously aware of their eroticized anger. Instead, they see their drive for sex as a mashup of emotions such as loneliness, frustration, and disappointment. One client, one of my clients, put it like this. My wife and I were eating dinner and got in a fight about something stupid. I think it was really one of those fights about who took out the garbage last. We started stonewalling, and she eventually just left the table and turned on Netflix. I was ticked and headed to the basement. Next thing I know, I was scrolling through social media sites and ended up looking at porn on Tumblr. I hated the bind I was in. I didn't want to be looking at porn, but I end up feeling so sexual when I am frustrated. We can lust for sex. We can lust for food. We can lust for virtually any dimension of life. But when we do not get what we desire, we find our hearts full of anger and we demand to be filled. This is why treatment paradigms that exclusively focus on lust management, such as blocking software and accountability groups, and trauma-focused therapy, like attachment theory or EMDR, will only go so far in maturing people. These paradigms contain dangerous partial truths that set people up to continue to sexually fail because the other half of the equation is left to fester in hiding. Want to find out why you're so compelled to pursue unwanted sexual behavior? Figure out what's made you so angry. Really quick, I considered putting a picture of the Hulk in here and I almost wish I had. Let's take a look at how the confluence of lust and anger shaped the, most, shaped the sexual fantasies of the respondents in my research. The most common sexual fantasy men had was the desire for power over women. Men who wanted power over women tended to fantasize about teen, petite, and college-age women from another race, and pursued fantasies in which women were portrayed as submissive. What predicted this type of sexual fantasy in men? As it turned out, there were three main factors, their relationships to shame, their sense of futility, and the strictness of their fathers. Men who wanted power over women had the highest levels of shame, lacked significant purpose, and had fathers who were overwhelmingly strict. The writing on the wall was that men found power over women arousing precisely because it gave them an arena to find dominance, dominance amidst the difficulties they were faci facing in life. Lust gives men the opportunity to escape pain, but eroticized anger demands someone else be used to exact revenge on the situation or person causing their discomfort. If we do not marvel at and honor beauty, we will inevitably bend it toward our control. As a society, we seem to be waking up to the reality of how much the beauty of women has been exploited for the sexual gain of men. In porn, we see this with even greater clarity. For many years, the most visited pornogra pornography site in the world was devoted to women stripping on webcams. A unique fe feature of this site was that it, it allowed men to tell the women what they wanted to see them perform on camera. Estimates at the time were that of the billion people using the internet, 
2.5% visited the site each month, equating to an astronomical 32 million people. Sites like this, though, though fairly benign according to porn standards, show how committed men are not just to lust for beauty, but also to direct the lives of women for sexual entitlement. I am convinced that one of the reasons we have not seen more progress in the reduction of pornography is that it seems very few people outside of Jesus and pornographers seem to understand that the heart is seduced by behaviors that allow lust and anger to be indulged. Pornography traces the human heart trajectory from lust to a demand to control beauty and, if you stay long enough, to a desire to see the body and face of a woman degraded. If you want to see your unwanted sexual behavior transformed, name anger and lust as the partners in crime they are. Too often, people of faith have, loquacious, have been loquacious in discussing purity, lust, and even sexual addiction, but largely silent on the issue of anger and power as it relates to male violence against women. Our preoccupation with lust and our avoidance of anger may be central to why many of us have not been able to find freedom. We cannot transform sexualized anger when we have so little language or willingness to state that it exists. The six core experiences of deprivation, dissociation, unconscious arousal, futility, lust, and anger reveal the why behind your current unwanted sexual behavior. These are the stories that await your engagement. Although sexual brokenness may have long seemed like an impediment to cultivating a spiritual life, it can be the very means God uses to transform you into the person you've always wanted to be. That was a lot of reading, and now I'm very tired. Um, so, I want to just really quickly point out on screen these six ideas and how they interact and build off each other. And I would invite you to think about how much of each one you ha might have in your life. I, again, me being the chemistry nerd that I am, I think back to the, stru to the chemical structures and how those atoms build those structures. It's like, what is your structure? What has come from your story? What baggage do you hold? Because it's going to be unique to you. The elements are similar everywhere we go, but your structure is unique. And then, as you're thinking about that, we can talk about, or we can think back to last week about what do we want to aim at? What are we pursuing? And we'll talk about, well, the next step next week.